So last week, we got through verses 9 to 14. We discussed what it meant to be filled with the knowledge of his will so that we can live a life worthy of how we've been called and pleasing him in every way. We had a discussion around what growing and bearing fruit meant and what uh, Christian fruit was. Uh, and we, we talked a little bit about growing and godly knowledge and the importance of that. And we finished up, uh, we got up to verse 11, and we were just starting to talk about the, the phrase, all power, in verse 11. So let me just jump right back in and pick up from, from that point. So if you recall, in, in the context of this, this passage, 9 to 14, verse 11 says, um, so live a life worthy of the Lord, please him in every way, bearing fruit, growing in the knowledge and being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience in giving joyful thanks to the Father. And when I studied this, and when I read it, when I really, really read it, I, I, I had to challenge myself. Because that phrase, being filled with all power of his glorious might, and glorious might, really think of that as a strength of his glory, right? So Paul's prayer as if the Colossians and, and the believers today will be filled with all power and the strength of God's glory. And that's what I call a Sunday school phrase. That's at least in my, in my, my study, meaning it's something I hear and I think intellectually I understand, but I had to really pause and, and ask myself, do I really see God's power around me? Do I really see God's power in my life? Or have I become a little bit immune to it? And maybe the Colossians had become immune to it. And that's why some of them were searching for things to supplement that, things to add into the gospel and, and God's power. And when I began to think about, you know, Paul's prayer of encouragement here for the believers to be strengthened with his great and glorious power, and there's lots of other scriptural support for that, right? This is not a unique prayer. This is not a unique aspect. You can look in Romans 8, uh, you know, 31 talks about if God is for us, who can be against us. Later in, in verse 37 of Romans 8, there's a discussion around we are more than conquerors. And lots of other examples. And so again, I began to challenge myself. Do I really see God's power? Do I know what God's power even is? And I think what Paul is reminding the Colossians and the encouragement that we should take today is remembering that, you know, living our faith, walking our faith, remaining in Christ. It's a journey that never stops. It can be really challenging. Sometimes it may feel impossible. And the reminder to the Colossians and what I take from it and what I'm hoping to share with you is don't let this be a Sunday school verse. Don't let this be something that you, you learn and you hear and you never really, really deeply understand and stop and ponder. The power of God's glory working in our lives through the Holy Spirit. And so I think that's an encouragement for, for all of us. Yes, brother? Why don't you go ahead and explain this to us while you're there. Uh, and his incredible great power for us who believe, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and when he seated him at his right hand. You must be looking at my notes. So the comment from, from Brother Short is around God's exceeding great power, including the power of re the resurrection of, of Christ. And later on, what I'm going to share is that, you know, this power, it's the power of creation. It's the power of resurrection. It's the power of the gospel. This is not just something that's trivial. This is a big, big deal. It's kind of like the introduction of Colossians, where he says, grace and peace to you from God the Father, and remember, we talked about what a big deal grace and peace really was. My point is that this power, the strength of his glorious might, let that be a big deal. That is a big deal. Don't just read it and, and, and keep going. So my challenge to myself was, I think sometimes I've fallen into the trap where I've stopped seeing God's power. I've become immune to it. I've become accustomed to it. Or maybe I have blinders on or whatever. And I think for the Colossians, that was some of the same message, again, because they were maybe only seeing a small fraction of God's power. 
and thinking that maybe that's all there is, and therefore they wanted to rely on other things, some of the synchronistic aspects we talked about, pulling in rituals from other religions, pulling in beliefs from other religions, pulling in humanism and human philosophy, trying to add to the gospel, because they thought God's power wasn't enough. So I saw this quote, and it really struck with me. So this is from one of the expositional commentaries I was reading, and it described his glory, remember the strength of God's glory, as a flashing brightness of the divine self-manifestation, and in that light resides the strength, which the standard or measure of the gift to us, the tremendous force of the sunbeam, which still falls so gently on a sleeper's face, as not to disturb the closed eyes, is but a parable of the strength which characterizes the divine glory. And the phrase that jumped out to me was the power of the sunbeam. And my inner nerd could not resist. Well, how much power is in a sunbeam? Well, I'm going to give you some silly math to make a theological point. So the silly math is that if you take about a square yard of land on a sunny day and you have direct sun, you get about one kilowatt or one hair dryer's worth of energy on that on that land, okay? Sean's laughing because he knows I'm, I'm just such a nerd. Well, that is a mere fraction of the actual power that's coming from the sun. It's like two ten hundred thousandths of a percent, right? It's almost too small to measure. The actual power from the sun for that one square yard is really like 30 or 40,000 hair dryers. Okay, so mag magnify what you feel, that little warm feeling on your cheek, magnify that by 30 or 40,000 40, times, and you're getting close to the actual power behind that sunbeam. I kind of saw this as a metaphor for maybe how we forget how much power God really has, right? The power of creation, the power to create the universe, the power to resurrect, the power to save. So when you see that sunbeam, when you see that blessing in your life, when you hear that prayer, when you feel that response, that spiritual response to the, the hymns that you're singing, that's just the sunbeam. And don't forget that there are at least 30 or 40,000 times that power just in that one little piece. And I think it's a reminder again to the Colossians that this all power that we serve, that we are unified with, if you have that, if you really see that and let that work in your life, you don't, need the add, you don't need to add to it with traditions. You don't need to add to it with rituals. You don't need to add to it with philosophy. You don't need to add to it with angels or supplement it with anything. It's no wonder that in one of his other letters, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I hope that we can let ourselves do the, do the same thing. And just to be accurate, I'm not trying to actually quantify God's power, right? Don't walk out here and think, okay, it's 30 or 40,000 hair dryers, right? It's just silly math. It's just silly math to make a point that we need to not become immune to the power of God working in our lives and the power that he can have working in the lives of others. So, brother, I think you raised your hand. The reminder from Brother Tyrone is in Acts 1 when the apostles asked Christ if he was going to restore the kingdom. And he said that doesn't matter and referred them in, in verse 8 where it says, look, the power that you're supposed to have is the power to witness and to evangelize, to, to be my disciples. I'm going to build a little bit on the conversation we had last week around producing that Christian fruit, which we said is not necessarily the fruit of the Spirit. It's really being a disciple. It's truly being a, a follower, a believer, and then a follower of the teachings of Christ and being, being that disciple. So let's keep going here. So, so you do these things, right? You're growing and bearing fruit. You're filled with the knowledge of God. You're filled with all of his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience in giving joyful thanks 
to the Father. This is the kind of endurance and patience that comes from a mature believer, someone who's been through and experienced, they have that contact knowledge through enough that they have developed a, a perspective. I always call it the eternal perspective, right? And I think that's what this verse is referring to here, that as mature believers, we have this perspective on daily trials, and through the power of God working in our lives, and through our faithful living walk, we have this eternal perspective built on experiencing God, walking in our faith, and it helps lead us to a state of thankfulness. And I think what Paul is reminding the Colossians, and, and so often you'll hear me say he's doing something for the Colossians, and then I'll immediately flip and say, and he's doing it for us today, because I think the power of this letter and the power of the Bible is it's timeless. And so much of the context of the Colossians we may call it different names, but as we established in week one, we're seeing the same thing today. You know, I, 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 I tell a lot of people that throughout time, humans may know more, we're acquiring more knowledge, but we're not getting any smarter. And I think so much of what the Colossians were facing, we're still facing today. And I wish we had more time to dwell on it, but I'll just leave you with this tidbit. I think it's purposeful that Paul is mentioning these three aspects together, endurance, patience, and giving joyful thanks. And there's a whole nother discussion around, you know, we could go to Philippians 4, we don't have time to dwell there, but in Philippians 4, when, when Paul talks about being thankful during circumstances, remember, he's not thankful for circumstances necessarily, but even despite the circumstances, within any circumstance, he is thankful, and he has a joyful thanks to God the Father. And I think... There's a purposeful intersection between endurance and patience and thankfulness. And again, I wish we could go into that more, but I'll just plant that seed and let you all think about it. We'll come back to um, living a word, and, and sorry, and, and thankfulness, don't forget, is part of that living a worthy life, right? In the context of this passage, in verse 10, it talks about so that you can live a life worthy. The key point here is don't forget thankfulness even during bad circumstances, and remembering to be thankful also in the good circumstances is part of that life and that worthy calling that we have. So that's, that's important. Continue on, on into verse 12. So giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. And when... The scripture here says qualified, the word used, hikon, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. It's a weird looking word. It means to make sufficient, right? So qualified, oftentimes in, in our culture, we think we're qualified for something. It's usually the result of a test or some effort or something that we have done. We have now become qualified. It's like a certification. That is not at all the idea that Paul is talking about here. Qualified means we have been made sufficient, and it's God's gift to us. It's his power working in our lives through the Holy Spirit where we have been made sufficient. And for inheritance, remember who he's writing to. At this time in that culture, you know, I don't know that, that too many of us talk about inheritances and things like that these days, but in that time, that would have been a much more culturally significant discussion and I think it's an allusion to Ephesians 1.14, because remember, we should actually be doing a study of Colossians in parallel with Ephesians, but I'm not smart enough to do that, so we're just going to do Colossians. But it's referring, I think, to Colossians 1.14, and part of that talks about when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. And if you think about, again, the context of that culture at that time, I think he's also alluding to the time uh, when the children of Israel were brought into the land of Canaan, where a portion was assigned to everyone as part of their inheritance. So again, I think this language where he's talking about you've been qualified as part of an inheritance, right? The point he's making is this is God's gift to you. He's purposefully, intentionally giving this thing to you as your inheritance, and I think that would have, that would have resonated. 
And then he talks about the kingdom of light. And if you kind of go back to the sunbeam conversation and the silly math, I think it gives you kind of a visual sense of, of what he's trying to do here. But remember that being in the light is not trivial. There is tremendous power, and he's just trying to describe the kingdom of light, this eternity with God, which I think is a concept that our, our poor brains can't really even fully understand. But he's using some really powerful language here. And it's not some wispy thing, but it's this kingdom of light is born of an infinite power. It's the power that God used to create the entire universe. And I also, I love the beautiful imagery of Paul here when he talks about the kingdom of light. I think, at least for me, that's just a really striking image. And I expect he was, again, targeting some things there in the Colossians context where they were really, at least some of them seem to be obsessed with the worship of angels that usually are represented as beings of light. And I think what he's painting the picture here is that, hey, look, there's a whole kingdom of this waiting for you. There's a whole kingdom of it. So if we look at Paul's prayer so far, and remember he leads off with this talking about being filled with godly knowledge, I think we're seeing a model of, well, when I have this godly knowledge, when I'm in, the, in pursuit of it, and as I'm gaining it, what are some of the benefits of it? And again, if you have this godly knowledge, you're living in a way that pleases God, right? Living a life, a worthy life. You live a productive life. You're being a true disciple. You're producing that Christian fruit that we talked about last week. You're progressing in your spiritual life. You're growing. You're maturing. You're developing more of that contact knowledge through um, evangelistic activities, through scripture reading, through prayer, through worship together in the, in the brotherhood. You're living with power. You're living with power, and, you, and to me, this is the, the real encouragement. You have the steadiness of God's hope. Because we have that eternal hope, that provides a calm and a strength and a steadiness, and we talked a few weeks ago about that anchor and that's one of the benefits we have as, as believers. We have the joy of belonging to God's kingdom. It's the ultimate membership card, right? And we have the peace of God's forgiveness. We're free from, we're free from that eternal judgment. And it makes me just kind of pause and ask, man, I can't think of one problem we have in the world today that wouldn't be solved by more people with more, more godly knowledge. And I think this could be another point, too, is we have the chance to witness to, to other people in our lives or people we come across. If you ever find yourself in a discussion around, you know, oh, I don't like the limits of the church or the limits of Christianity or, oh, you guys are all about rules or, you know, whatever that is. You know, there are a hundred ways that conversation can happen. Maybe think about the benefits of godly knowledge and maybe think about the joy we have, the thankfulness we have, that peace and that steadiness and that, that maturing we have, and that eternal perspective, again, at the intersection of patience, endurance, and thankfulness. Again, all three aspects of which I wish more of the world had, had today. So moving on, verse 13. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So earlier on in this passage, when Paul describes the qualification, right, how we have been made sufficient, and he describes the inheritance that we have into the kingdom of light, this, this verse expands on what that qualification is, and it expands on, on what that kingdom of light is. In other words, it provides detail on, on what the qualification is. What I really liked about this verse is, at least in the NIV, it uses the word rescued. Not all translations use that rescue, but it's the same word that we often read as deliver, like in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. But the NIV, I think, is a more accurate translation because it says rescued. And at least for me, when I think, you know, deliver me from evil or uh, deliver me from the dominion of darkness, that doesn't sound as powerful as rescue. Right? Rescue seems to me imply that I am powerless 
I'm in, drowning in the middle of the ocean. I'm, I'm stranded in a blizzard on the top of a mountain. All of my power has been exhausted. I need someone to intervene. I need to be rescued. I need, I need to be plucked from the fire, right? Whereas deliver sounds a little bit like, well, I came part way, and God, you do the rest. And I want to be really clear, that's not the context. That's not the definition of the word here. I think rescue, it's a much better definition, and it's much truer to the meaning of this, of this word. And just to be really, really specific, you know, that word, well, I, I gave you the pronunciation there. It literally implies removing someone from the middle or in the midst of that danger or the oppression, right? It's delivered right out of, right, to the, to the, to the rescuer. So it's a very passive thing on our part, very active on the point of the rescuer. And to just be really, really clear, this is kind of my takeaway, don't read this as some kind of angelic, singing, heart playing, backlit Christ figure coming in to help you walk the rest of the way. That's not what this verse is saying. This is really more like a firefighter breaking down the door of a burning building to rescue you just before you your lungs filled with smoke and you die. So I want to give you some a real visual cue here so that we don't walk away thinking it's some kind of wispy, wonderful thing. No, you, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And so it's, it's this gritty firefighter breaking down the door. That's the kind of rescue that, that we're talking about here. And we're rescued from the dominion of darkness. And I think this is a, a really clever phrase because I see this as both literal and metaphorical. It's both things at the same time for me. It's a direct contrast to the kingdom of light that Paul talks about in, in verse 12. And, you know, he, he is uh, he's so articulate the way that God guided him to write these letters. And he provides such amazing structure and imagery. Just to, Even if you study this only as a form of literature, it's really impressive then when you layer on the spiritual aspects, it really becomes just, just amazing. But this is a contrast to the, uh, the kingdom of light in verse 12. But the dominion of darkness, I think, is referring both to the, the darkening of our hearts in a sinful world if we're not hedged, if we're not shielded. And it refers, obviously, to the eternal lake of fire. It refers to hell. So it has both a near-term and an eternal eternal view here. And I think the encouragement is that we have been rescued not just now, but we've also been rescued for eternity. And I think he, that's a reminder again to the Colossians as well as, as well as to ourselves. And when we're rescued, oh, sorry, let me go back. When we're rescued, we're brought into the kingdom of the son he loves. So if you go back to that firefighter image, that same firefighter didn't just grab you out of the burning building, plop you on the front steps, and then walk off. That same firefighter then takes you lovingly to his own home, which happens to be the kingdom of light. And it's only then do you realize that it's Jesus as the firefighter. Through a, a soot-stained smile, then you realize who it is. That's the imagery that Paul is going for here. And think about how the Colossians may react if that's how it has been received. Now, they didn't have firefighters back in those days, right? They would have thought of something different. But if you think about the power of that imagery and the power of the message, I, hopefully they would have stopped and, and said, well, wait a minute. Well, if we have all this, why do we need anything else, right? Paul keeps beating on that same theme that Christ is sufficient, the gospel is sufficient. You don't need to add anything else to it. So the question was, uh, the way the verse reads, it, you know, Travis is saying that it, he thinks it's God is the firefighter and he's transferring us to the sun, and if I have any comment on that. My comment is I think that's great. I think, um, you know, spiritually, I don't know that it makes a difference, right? Because I think of God, Father, and the Holy Spirit. When I think about the power of the gospel, it's, it's the, the Trinity all together together. 
And my example, it's just a visual image of, of, of trying to make the point that it's, it's not, um, maybe I'm using the wrong words, it's not just a wispy, you know, happy-go-lucky, wonderful, everyone get along situation. It's, it's a situation where we're in the middle of a burning room. And I think, you know, if I extend your, your point, when you get out of that room, do you care if it's Jesus or God? They're the same. They're different manifestations of the same thing. And we, we could extend that metaphor as much as you want, I think. I don't know if that answered your question satisfactorily or not, or if you had other, other reactions. Right. The, the, the point is, it's just contrasting deliver versus rescue. That's the point I'm making. So, so the comment is around a, a, a bit of a, a different opinion on our role as the one being rescued and whether we have a role in that or not. And he was sharing that, well, you know, maybe using my, my metaphor, you know, maybe they, we try to navigate to a burning building or we're standing at the window waving or, or whatever. Um, I, I think we could have a great uh, Romans 14 discussion on, on debatable matters. Um, I think where we can agree that it's 99.999% God and some small fraction maybe of, right? We do have to hear, we have to see, we have to repent, we have to confess, we have to submit to baptism. Uh, I think the role of discipleship, there is, there is some effort on our part because we do take on some persecution. We have to grow, we have to be intentional about our prayer life and about our walk and about evangelizing. So in that context, I'll agree with you. But if the context is anything around the power to save, I'm going to disagree with you. I think it's just like Jesus. Jesus did have power, but yet he did not pull, his, pull himself by his own bootstraps. Uh, he, 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 he reached out to God. He expected God to help him as a man, even though he had power. It, and he, he was doing things on the earth, but yet he knew his ultimate dependency was on God. And that's the point here in Colossians. It's not that we don't have that. Yeah, the, the, the comment there, if, if I can paraphrase, is a little bit on, well, what's the source of the power, right? Now, we may use some of it, but the source of the power is all about God. Now, I've kind of put my own filter on, on the words that you shared. Uh, but one thing you did say that I forgot to mention, when I talked about the intersection of endurance and patience and thankfulness, and this is really, really important, it's a thankfulness of humility. It's a thankfulness of humility, and that's really, really important when we think about that, that eternal perspective. And that humility comes from a recognition that all good things have come from God. You know, we haven't earned them, nor do we deserve them. And it's out of that humility that our thankfulness stems. And that kind of helps feed that patience and endurance piece. And, and again, we, we, we don't really have time to go much more into that. Uh, but, but that was one important point that I forgot to mention a little while ago. So moving on, of the son he loves... So, you know, this is not just a beloved 
son. But this is the son in whom his love is made manifest. And again, think about the definition of God's grace, where God is inclining to man through Jesus Christ to provide us the, the gospel. So when it says of the son he loves, we need to be aware that this is the son in whom his love is made, is made manifest. And we'll see more on this later when we talk about how Christ is the image of God and what image means. And he goes on to say, of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption. And there's a phrase I use a lot of times. You'll, you may hear me say, words mean things. And this is no exception. And I think it's interesting how he describes it's in whom we have redemption. It's not through whom, which could kind of feel transitory. It's not by whom, which feels kind of like a handoff or a relay. But it's in whom. And the, the implication is that there's a union with Christ. And it's a permanent union. And if you recall verse 2, where he, in the introduction, he's talking about to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father. And we'll talk more about that union and that remaining in Christ later in, in the study. For the forgiveness of sins. The, obviously, I think most everyone here understands that this is really the fundamental meaning of redemption. It's the most basic definition of, of forgiveness and redemption because our sins are blotted out and they're remembered oh, no more. And there's, there's lots of scriptural support for that. And I listed just a few on the slide for anyone who, who wants a reminder. So even though that's a lot that we've unpacked this morning, I now want to move to the next passage, verses 15 through 20. Because in the letter to the Colossian, Paul, to the Colossians, Paul now transitions from talking about the power of salvation to verses 15 through 20, which is the supremacy of, of Christ. And I think most of us, when we think about Colossians, that's probably the phrase we kind of go to. We think, oh yeah, that's the letter that talks about the supremacy of, of Christ. Um, and that's kind of where I was. This passage is kind of what came to mind before I put together the study. But I hope that as we're on this discussion together, we're starting to see a little more context around why the supremacy of Christ, why the defense of the character of Christ and that doctrine is so important, both for the Colossians and for the, what I would argue are a lot of the same struggles we're, we're seeing today in our culture. So when you think about these five verses, you see a couple of things. Paul's going to go through and talk about the image of Christ. He's going to describe Christ's role as the firstborn. He's going to describe the, his power of creation and that because of that power of creation, the intimate contact knowledge that Christ has of all things. He's going to talk about his eternal nature. He's going to talk about Christ's position as head over all things. He's going to talk about Christ's power over death. And he's going to talk about Christ's ability to save us. So let's dive into that. In case you can't tell, I'm really trying to accelerate through some of this. I'm, I'm no way I'm going to get to the end of chapter 4 by this study, but I'm at least trying to get into chapter 4. So bear, bear with me if I'm being a little bit speedier. So in these five verses, what we see is an attempt to kind of extol and explain that exalted character of Christ. And this needs to be a big deal for us. And I think his point was, hey, Colossians, this is a big deal for you. Right? The gospel that you heard and have received includes this exalted Christ. And that Christ's character is a truth that really underpins our faith. And not only does it underpin our faith, it's actually what I believe differentiates our faith from other religions in the world. Right? It's the resurrected Christ. It's the act of God leaning in through Christ to us to give us redemption that is unique from Islam Judaism, Taoism, Darwinism, Buddhism, almost any other ism that, that I've studied, what's unique about our faith is Christ and that exalted character. I think Paul is, is reminding the Colossians as well that, look, this is, this is a big deal. This is, this is the true message of the gospel, which is Christ resurrected. That's the thing. You can't, you can't lose focus of that. And I think we have to take on that same that same reminder. 
And it also addresses a lot of the non-scriptural beliefs that the church, or at least some members of the church, were struggling with at the time. So let's get into these verses. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him, through him and in him, for him, sorry. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shared on the cross, shed on the cross. The word image here is not just a Xerox copy. It's not a reflection. It's not a shadow. It's a replication, a true, complete replication from the original. Better think of this as a twin than an image. It's this word, this, uh, this phrase is used in the New Testament to represent a real embodiment, an essential, fully functioning, complete embodiment. So it's not a likeness. I want to make that clear. You can think about, um, and I may have the wrong reference on my slide in my notes that says John 14, 9. I'll, I'll let you guys figure that out, and I'll correct it later for the, once we post these online. But when Christ says, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Right? So again, it's not just a likeness or a, a Xerox. It's a fully embodied, it's like a twin, right? It's a full, full replication. And by describing how preeminent Christ is over all other beings, especially angels, again, think about who he's writing to, Paul's refuting the idea of anyone who wants to worship angels, right? Why would you worship something created instead of worshiping the creator, right? That's kind of the point he's making here. And at that time, there was one sect of the Jewish religion, the Essenes, who were really, really focused on the worship of angels, and they thought that they had a role in creation and some other, some other things. And so that's one of the influences that Paul is directly, directly going after here. When Christ is described as the firstborn, the firstborn over all creation, right? He was born, he was begotten before anything else, before any creature was made. This is scripture's way of representing eternity. This is scripture's way of taking a concept that we can't actually comprehend and putting it in language that, yeah, we can kind of get, get it sort of a little bit. It's scripture's way of representing eternity, which as we know, hopefully we know, is one of the defining aspects of, of God. And in that culture, don't forget that firstborn would have had some extra meaning, right? Things like the firstborn gets a double inheritance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, one commentator I read actually mentioned that in early times, uh, the firstborn was often the officiating priest in the family in the absence or on the death of the father. I don't know if anyone has come across that, but I think that's maybe an interesting point. But the key here is that Paul is emphasizing that any of the usual distinctions and honors that would be conferred on the firstborn in the family. He's meaning to say that among all the creation of God, among all the creatures of God, Christ occupies a preeminence similar to that firstborn, that firstborn status. And he's basically saying that if any firstborn has any privilege, any authority, or any additional power, then Christ is the first firstborn. Right? So that's what he's trying to say there to the, to the church. He's the first firstborn. For in him all things were created. And the word for here refers to both parts of that preceding verse. If you go back and look at it, it's referring to the image of God, how Christ is the image of God. And it's referring to how Christ is the firstborn of all creation. He was there before eternity started. And in John 1, 3, we're reminded through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Right, so again, there's a lot of scriptural support for this idea that all things were created through Christ, that he truly is the firstborn. 
And as we get into the second part of verse 16, we get some details on what all things mean. It says, for in him all things were created. And he goes on to talk about things that are seen and unseen. Well, the things that are seen, I don't know that I need to explain that too much, right? It's the, the obvious splendor of the sun, the stars, the moon, the grass, and everything, right? The interesting point, I think, is the unseen or the invisible things. And again, here, Paul goes right after some of that false teaching. When he further talks about the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, uh, my Bible had a really interesting reference to Ephesians 1.21, which had its own subnote that says those words, thrones or powers, rulers or authorities, in, in the rabbinic thought at that time, so kind of in the Jewish rabbinic conversation of that time, that phrase described different orders of angels. Right? So again, Paul is discussing, or what he's trying to say is that, look, whatever else is out there in the spiritual realm, Christ is over all of it. He's, he's basically making that concept of the order of angels irrelevant in terms of worship. I think I've got time for one more slide. The phrase here, all things have been created through him and for him. It's describing the creation of the universe. The language that Paul uses is strikingly similar to that used in Genesis chapter 1. And I think the Colossians, the, the brothers and sisters in the church at that time, they, they would have understood that. That would have been extra meaningful for them. They would have understood that. And it describes the Son as the first maker. He's the continual preserver of all creatures in earth and in heaven. Even the various orders of the angelic beings, right? Again, he keeps hitting that same point over and over. And he's trying to show the Colossians the folly, again, of worshiping something that was created as opposed to worshiping and only worshiping the creator. Because this idea of worshiping angels or other things, what it does is it, it tries to diminish the role of Christ. It takes the doctrine of the character of Christ and makes it just another chapter. It makes it something less than it really is. Instead of the sole focus, it's making it an addition to, to something else. And we'll hear more about that in chapter 2. And I think what I want to leave you with uh, now I'm going to do one more slide after this. So the point I want to leave on this slide is that today, I think it's a reminder for us to allow nothing in our lives, nothing in our worship, nothing in our walk to diminish the role of Christ. In all of our teachings and all of our beliefs, Christ has to remain supreme over all, all things. Christ and the resurrection, again, what is the true message of the gospel? It's Christ and the resurrection. And that needs to be not only the focus point, it needs to be the only thing. Right? That's, that's, what our faith, that's what our faith is. And I think Paul is reminding the Colossians there that, look, quit adding other stuff. Christ is enough. And not only is he enough, he's over everything. So anything you add to it actually takes away from the role of Christ. It diminishes his role. In verse 17... The words he is, are the, both of those are emphasized. Which, and we should read this as he and only he is before all things. So that's, again, that's the point where he's saying, look, Christ is the pinnacle. Christ is the top. He and only he was created before all things. And he's not just the creator. He also holds everything together. He's the power of creation. He's the power that sustains it, right? Brother Short mentioned earlier about the power of God. And again, it's, it's the power to create the universe and the power to save. So, um, again, we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget and try to diminish that. And he's the head of the church. The head of the church, I'm going to finish this slide and I'll let you go get a donut. The head of the church is our creator. He's the authority. So, again, nothing else can top that. And we'll finish this up next week. Thanks for your attention.